an event that's being run by the um, CARE Committee, which is a committee within FENS, which looks at the um, use of animals and how we can support researchers who are trying to um, use animals and experiments responsibly and engage with the public. And what we wanted to do was to have a discussion, um, a sort of a set of presentations followed by a question and answer session to discuss some of the issues surrounding animal experimentation, um, including how to conduct it responsibly and also how we might be able to find um, alternatives to animals for some types of research. So we're going to have presentations from three speakers, um, Peter Janssen, Sam Solomon and Tara Spires jones all of whom have been engaged in um, doing animal experiments in uh, different species. So um, looking at how you can use different animal models to address different problems. So they're going to do a presentation uh, each of five to 10 minutes. And then after that, we're gonna have a panel discussion and we invite you, the members of the audience to uh, post questions on the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat and then um, some of those questions will be selected and we'll um, get them to the panel and we'll have some discussion about that. So um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Peter Janssen to give us the first presentation. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Hmm. Yes. This is okay? You see the slide? Yes. Okay. So my talk <clears throat> is about intercortical recordings in humans, uh, in human visual cortex. So the background of this is work that we've been doing in Leuven, in Belgium. And I show this aerial view to show the importance of the proximity of research labs, which are here. All these buildings are research labs and the hospital, which is this part. And it's all connected with tunnels because if you want to do these types of experiments, this is in patients that are implanted with electrodes. Um, you really have to go in the hospital with all your equipment and with all the technical support that we need. Uh, and so that's why it's very important to be close to each other. Um, so the, I've done monkey recordings for most of my career, um, starting out with infrotemporal cortex, the parietal cortex, frontal cortex. Um, and in the last four or five years, we invested a lot in trying to get human recordings going. I show here a monkey fMRI picture of areas that are activated more by 3D surfaces than by flat surfaces. You see there's a network of areas here. And this is a similar study done in humans where you again see activations in the ventral stream, dorsal stream, and a bit in frontal cortex. So you see that there are similarities between the two species if you use the same technique. But <clears throat> of course, we don't know what the cells are actually doing, whether we see, whether we would find the same neural properties in both species. And so this is published work. Um, that I show here on the right side. Uh, so I do this work in collaboration with Tom Tess, who is the neurosurgeon here in the hospital, he did his PhD with me, and Thomas de Kramer, who was the resident at the time, who was a PhD student that did uh, the recordings in human lateral occipital cortex. And so the, we had the opportunity to implant a um, Utah array, which looks like this. It's a 10 by 10 microelectrode array 96 usable electrodes that was implanted here in the human brain, in another human brain. Um, this is a surgical picture and you can see the spikes that we could record. These patients are implanted for about two weeks uh, to monitor the epilepsy, but at the same time, we can um, also look at the properties of neurons when the patient does tasks. Um, so we had two patients we did fMRI in these patients, the traditional LO localizer, images of objects versus scrambled images. You see the LO activations in both patients, and you see the array location here and here. Both were implanted in the more posterior part of the lateral occipital complex. Here you see a screenshot of the spikes. All the red lines are individual action potentials of neurons in the LOC of the human. I hope you can, I'm going to show a video now of the patient doing a task in the hospital. So the electrodes, both the Utah array and the clinical electrodes 
come out with cables here. Uh, so that's why the, you have these bandits jump around the head of the patient. We build a setup in the hospital where we can show all kinds of stimuli with eye movement control. And I'm going to show you, I hope you have also here the sound. This is the cell that we are recording now. It's a very big action potential. The patient is passively fixating now images of objects on the screen. You hear the beep, which is the reward that normally the monkey would get. The patient doesn't get reward, of course. Um, but you can see that you can do these kinds of experiments in highly controlled circumstances. It's very similar to what you would do with a monkey. And you can then test the properties of neurons. I'm not going to talk a lot about the data themselves. This is a neuron that was very shape-sensitive. Shape it responded very strongly to intact shapes. That's the red curve. It didn't respond to scrambled shapes. And you see the tuning for intact shapes. This is the preferred shape here, the red curve. This is the non-preferred shape. And for scrambled shapes, of course, there was no real tuning. We can do receptive field mapping, which is very essential for visual neuroscientists to see what are the properties of the neurons. Well, you have to do, map the receptive field. And you see here, this is uh, contralateral ipsilateral. This was a 30 by 50 degree display. You see that many cells respond centrally, but also ipsilaterally. And this is the ipsilateral hemifield, some bilateral. Um, so you, we had relatively large receptive fields that were frequently bilateral. And this is something that is very difficult to do without recordings uh, in the cortex. We did 3D uh, experiments in the same patients, because um, remember that I recorded when I did my PhD and many years afterwards in the frontotemporal cortex of the monkey here, cells that respond to curved surfaces selectively, this one more to concave than to convex. And we saw very similar selectivity for in the patient. Um, here, this is a cell that responds more to convex at every position in depth just like the neurons in monkey infrotemporal cortex. So we do see similar properties in humans and patients. And then we did the second study on faces because by accident of one of the patients, this array was located in face selective cortex. Um, and we saw very strong responses to faces like this neuron here uh, compared to objects. This is the spike waveform. I'm going to show you a few videos of the signal. This is the signal in the patient room. The very, very strong, very large action potentials. This is the patient is here, sitting here, looking at her mother. And you can hear the cell in the background responding. Look at, look at your mother. I don't know whether you can hear it, but... You hear the cell responding every time she looks at her mother. Now she's looking in the mirror, and you see the cell activity here. Looks away. Now looks again to the mirror. Away, nothing. And then again, eyes closed, nothing. And then very strong activity when she opens the eyes. Okay, so this is just to give you a flavor. We can look at selectivity now on individual electrodes. This is the outline of the array. This is the selectivity for faces versus bodies. You see that there are many face selective electrodes, but there are also a few body selective electrodes, like this uh, neuron. A very similar study to the monkey. We can test what the cells are actually responding to. This is responses to intact faces, and here responses to uh, scrambled faces or to faces which were uh, where the parts were just disorganized. And you see very similar responses. Um, so you can do answer many questions that we are used to try to answer in monkeys. We can do it now in human patients. So I just put a conclusion slide up here. Uh, discussing opportunities and, and uh, limitations that probably will also come up in the discussion after the talk.
Um, so we can have very detailed measurements now of the human brain at multiple levels, fMRI, local field potential, multi-unit, single unit activity. We can investigate the properties of neurons. We can investigate the microarchitecture of human cortex because these electrodes are spaced about half a millimeter apart. So we can look at the sort of clustering of neurons in the human brain. We can correlate it with behavior. And of course, the link with perception is of course much more obvious to do in humans than in monkeys. And of course, we acquire a large number of data at very high spatial and temporal resolution. And I think just because we can then look really at the neurons themselves, we can more directly investigate homologies between human and macaque brain areas. And one study, of course, cannot uh, determine that. You need many, many studies in many different areas to understand what the relationship is. Of course, there are also limitations. It's in a hospital environment, of course. That means that the yeah, patient is either tested in the bed or in a testing room, like I showed you in the beginning. Um, there is the limitation that we can use Utah arrays. We tried depth electrodes a lot, gave sometimes some signal, but we were not super happy with that. The Utah array gives very nice signal, gives lots and lots of neurons, but of course it's very short electrodes. So we can only study superficial cortex because uh, the electrodes are about 1.5 millimeter long. It's invasive, of course, so there's always a risk. Although these patients are implanted with many depth electrodes for clinical reasons, and they use the Utah array as a clinical monitoring uh, electrode in the cortex, but still it's an, another implantation. Um, you, of course, you have small number of subjects because you have these epilepsy patients come uh, in small numbers. Every couple of months we have a patient, but uh, that's still a limitation. And it's difficult to optimize the stimulus to the neuron. This specific for Utah array recordings, for all multi-electrode recordings, you just record everything and later you see what the cells are responding to. Uh, we tried a few causal perturbations like microstimulation, but that's not so easy. And of course, in an animal model, you have many more opportunities to either microstimulate or inactivate an area to find causal uh, relationship with uh, behavior. And there are, of course, similarities that we see with the macaque brain, but there are also differences. And it's really not so obvious how to handle these differences, what to think of those uh, data that are not, that don't seem to be consistent with the uh, monkey data. And of course, uh, that's another thing that we did. Many patients with brain areas that were not activated in fMRI, and that's not so easy to study because you don't know what the stimulus is that these cells respond to. And we, in three patients, we never found a stimulus that gave good responses. So there are many brain areas that are not activated easily in fMRI, and that is not so easy to study. Okay, that's all I had to say. So... Okay, thank you very much, Peter. I'm, I'm going, to, um, going to hand over to Sam Solomon now. Hi, can everyone see my screen as well? Yeah. It's a blank white screen, don't worry, you're not, not blind. Uh, thank you, Peter, for um, astounding recordings from human visual cortex. I'm actually also going to talk about uh, visual neuroscience. I'm not sure if that's a coincidence or <laughs> that uh, visual neuroscientists are particularly interested in these questions at the moment. And I think it might be to some degree the latter, and hopefully I'll get into that. So I'm now at University College London. Just to, I, Most of you won't know who I am or what I've done, so I just want to give you a couple of minutes um, overview of what I've been studying over most of my scientific career. And that is the visual pathway from the eye through to visual cortex. I'm particularly interested in how different parts of this pathway subserve different aspects of perception and how different the activity of different types of neurons might be differentially involved in different types of perception, how that activity might underlie perception. I've done recordings both from the retina, from the various uh, thalamocortical pathways that travel from the retina through to the primary visual cortex and from the various parts of the visual cortex, including both primary visual cortex and secondary visual areas like area MT, which is important in motion vision. I'm particularly interested in how the activity of neurons at one stage of the visual system 
shape and constrain the activity of neurons at subsequent stages that receive their inputs. So that, that's maybe, I hope, illustrates my particular set of interests here. I started off uh, recording, as did Peter from Monkeys, and I, I actually started off recording from a little New World monkey called a marmoset before graduating to macaques, and then also then returning to marmosets after that. But uh, about 10 years ago, I started to work in the mouse visual system for a variety of reasons, which I'll get into in a moment, but mainly attracted by the possibility to do um, large numbers of animals or larger numbers of animals. So there's more robust experimental design, also combine that with causal manipulations and the kinds of broad scale imaging that you can do. But when I started to um, work on mice, then I, I was faced with the question, and I still am faced with the question of what kinds of uh, questions can be about visual neuroscience can be addressed in, in rodents? Um, what kinds of interesting questions can be addressed in rodents? And uh, it's something I've, I've given a good deal of thought to over the years, and I'm still not exactly sure if I know the answer, but I'll, I'll put up a slide now, which illustrates some of the constraints and some of the concerns I have about studying rodents for vision. So this slide just attempts to distill uh, some of the different aspects of visual neuroscience, behavior, anatomy, functional work, correlational and causal manipulations, developmental studies, aging studies, for example, and illustrates in each column then what you can do to some degree in each of three different model species for want of a better word, but um, inherited from yesterday's um, discussion. So on the right, we have the human, in the middle we have monkey, and that might be a new world monkey like the marmoset or an old world monkey like the macaque. And on the left, we have rodents. So in humans, as Peter has shown very ably there, we're increasingly able to make measurements from different parts of the visual pathway, both inter invasively, but also non-invasively. Very interesting work in um, MEG as well as MRI coming through and giving increasingly precise estimates of neural activity as well as indirect measures of activity in the brain. Of course, we have incredible um, capacity now, increasingly refined capacity to understand behavior in human subjects. Uh, we can study development through longitudinal work. Indeed, at UCL, there's a long history of, of doing that in, uh, in human subjects. I suppose what's missing from humans is the capacity to, say, introduce viruses that target particular pathways to inhibit or um, excite them to do any form of germline manipulation to, to construct particular models. You can, of course, use twins to study some aspects of genetics, um, although that hasn't shed a huge amount of light in, um, in visual neuroscience, I think. With the monkey in the middle column there, you see most of the boxes are also green. <laughs> That's because most of the things are possible to do in the monkeys. What's not uh, possible really in monkeys, besides asking for direct reports, uh, which we can do in humans, is to really make the uh, viral and germline manipulations at the kind of scale that we are able to in rodents and therefore the kind of breadth of questions that we can address uh, using causal and genetic approaches in rodents. But on the left you see there's a lot of red bars and this is in the rodent column and there's a lot of concerns and constraints that come about when one starts to ask whether I can use a rodent to understand vision. So for example, in the retina, rodents are rod dominated, they have no fovea, that is they have no center of gaze as it were, unlike um, monkeys, including ourselves. The inner retina structure is fairly good, fairly consistent with uh, primates, but there are some differences. There doesn't seem to be a high spatial acuity pathway leaving the retina going to the thalamus. Indeed, in the thalamus is very poor segregation between different types of cell classes, and I'll get to that in the next slide. In V1, we don't see some of the classic anatomical structures which really characterize primate and human visual cortex. We don't know if there's a, an analog of V2 in um, mice and rodents. There's, there's several areas that are but V1, but whether any of them are actually analogous to the secondary visual area, which is just as large as the primary visual area in primates. And there's also very little, very unclear about whether subsequent pathways through the cerebral cortex match or map on to the dorsal and ventral streams that we think exist in primate, including human brains. We are getting better at training mice to do things and to report things in ways that are interesting, but uh, the behaviors that mice and other rodents exhibit mean that some things are, are probably never gonna be possible. And that's, for example, goal-directed eye movements like saccades, smooth pursuit of the form that we use to track objects uh, and fixation and executive control, including spatial attention. So a lot of these issues are probably going to be always confounded when studying rodents and, and perhaps very difficult to study at all. And it really does suggest that beyond the, um, I think what this slide attempts to 
make clear is that it's only really the courses questions in, in, in visual neuroscience that I think that are going to be appropriate for rodents. That is some of the basic questions like how do cells habituate or how do cells recover after injury, for example, and how do you um, help them recover in the eye? These kinds of questions which we can address, how cells live, how they die, how they adapt to things, how they might be plastic. Those very basic questions, which are common to a lot of neuroscience and not specific to visual neuroscience, I think are clearly addressable in rodents. But if we agree that the very particular structure of the primate visual pathway, and I'll show that in this slide here, is actually important for understanding the very particular structure of human visual perception. And it's very hard to understand how we are going to be able to study rodents to understand that. So this slide summarizes about 40 years of work in primates, including humans. It shows what it mainly what I wanted to show primarily is that the pathway from the eye through the optic nerve to the optic tract to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. This is the major visual pathway in primates, including humans, about 90% of all retinal output. It's a very particular pathway. There are very particular ganglion cells that form this pathway. They project to very particular parts of the thalamus and those parts of the thalamus project to very particular parts of the visual cortex. It's a, uh, there are no direct analogies to many of these projections in rodents. And so it's very hard to understand how we can map what we know about human visual perception does map in many ways quite nicely onto these pathways. And it's very hard to therefore understand how we can map do the reverse mapping from rodent pathways to rodent visual perception, how that may inform our understanding of humans. I think the other thing that uh, this, this uh, slide makes clear is that we know a hell of a lot about this pathway in primates. And it brings up a set of questions which I'm not quite sure I know the answer to yet. And I would like to pose to the panel and to perhaps the listeners out there. And that is what would be a sufficient understanding of this pathway? How could we agree that it's a sufficient understanding? And when could we say, let's move on and do something else now? So to kind of put those down a bit more concretely, I think it's important, especially in communicating with people who do not um, do animal experiments and might even have objections to animal experimentation. What is the end point? When will we actually know enough about the system that we're studying that we can stop using animals uh, to answer the questions that we need to answer? And it's a, it's a very difficult question. I think it's very specific to particular systems under study, but it would be nice to know that we actually had a set of criteria that we agreed on that would allow us to know that we'd reach a sufficient level of understanding of a particular system like that of the thalamocortical pathway in, in primates. What criteria might help us understand when one animal model is more appropriate than others? So when can we say, well, we understand this about primates, now, what we still need to understand is, for example, the connection between a retinal ganglion cell and a, and a LGN cell, but we don't need to study primates for that, we can study mice for that. So what kind of criteria would allow us to move to transition from one model to another? And what kind of criteria would then allow us to transition from any animal model to a lack of animal model, an in silico or an in vitro approach with cells, for example? I think being able to agree those kind of criteria in a domain specific fashion, would be very useful to be able to explain to those who may be opposed to animal experimentation about when we would have sufficient knowledge to understand these systems and when we could move to um, ones which did not require animal experiments. So thanks, I hope we might be able to discuss some of these issues uh, in the panel. Thanks very much, Sam. So I'm going to hand over to um, Tara Spires jones now. Just like to remind uh, the audience that if you do have um, any questions or things that you'd like the panel to um, discuss at the end, if you post them in the chat, we're, uh, we're monitoring the chat and we'll um, put those questions to the speakers. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Kate. Can I just confirm you're seeing the right slides here? Is that right? Yes. Great, thanks. Welcome everyone. I'm sorry you can't join us here in Scotland. It's actually for once a beautiful day. Um, but I'll just give you a really short rundown of some of the alternatives that we're looking at for our search for life-changing treatments in Alzheimer's disease. And then I really look forward to the discussion with everyone at the end. So first, a very brief introduction. I won't have to sell to you that Alzheimer's disease is a, a large problem in all of the dimensions for our society. The decade from 2002 to 2012 saw a 99.6% failure rate in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so we are really failing to translate. And there are many, many reasons for this, but one of them is that we don't have a perfect model for the disease to do preclinical studies in. So that's where I wanted to focus on today. 
So what I think, and this is of course open for debate, but what I think is we need multiple models uh, to approach this big problem of dementias, Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative diseases broadly. I started training in mice and I spent many years working in mice mouse models, uh, first of developmental neuroplasticity, then of Huntington's disease, then of Alzheimer's disease. And I still believe that there are very many things that we need an intact brain system for and that mice can model some aspects of the disease very well, but they can't model all aspects of the disease as we have found when we've tried to translate really solid mouse studies into therapeutics. So more recently, we've been incorporating things in my lab, including human postmortem tissue. We've been doing that for a long time now. And even more recently, we've had really lucky access to some human resected surgical tissue, a little bit like what Peter talked about with his remarkable recordings earlier. And we're also using cell cultures, human iPSC derived cells, for example. And there was a really nice opinion piece in 2018 in Nature that sort of encapsulated this idea for me. They said repeating experiments is not enough. We need to have not only multiple model systems, but multiple approaches to the, to the problem to end up with something useful or true. So this is the three things I'm just gonna give you little snippets of today. But first I'll tell you a little bit about what I think are the advantages and disadvantages of these different model systems. In our case, when we're studying a disease, the human brain tissue is our sort of ground truth. That's what actually happened in the disease. It's the most accurate picture of the disease, at least at the end, end stage. We can see differences between disease and control, but we're only seeing this snapshot. And it, like I say, it's usually at the end stage of the disease. And of course we have very limited ability to get mechanistic insights. And it's difficult to get sort of ideas of the time course of the disease because you're doing it in individuals in different parts of the disease, not able to follow people, at least in the postmortem tissue, over time. When we look at iPSC derived cells, they have a lot of potential because they have human genes and human proteins. They're very easy to manipulate when we have cells and culture, but they are very immature, sort of embryonic like, which is a real problem for our field because we're studying an age related to degenerative disease. And of course, there are very reduced systems. So, one of our cell types of interest, for example, microglia behave very differently when they're in a dish than when they're in a brain. When we look at the animal models, in particular the mice we work with, we, we have a little bit of work with flies now as well. You have a living brain and in the mice you have all the relevant cell types, or we think, that, that are playing in the disease. We can manipulate and study behavior as well as molecules and structure, but these are not humans and they don't always model human disease well. And more recently we're looking at the human resected tissue. We can look at the living human brain with many cell types. This is work that we haven't started, but other people are being able to, to take um, little bits of human resected tissue that would have been discarded at surgery and keep them alive in organotypic culture or acute slices. People like Claire Durant in my lab are working on this, and she's a, a Brad fellow who's working in our department. Um, and you can manipulate an experiment on either the resected tissue or the cells you isolate from the resected tissue. But, we're getting these from diseased brain by definition, because of course, these are people who had a clinical need for a surgery, not people who are participating in an experiment to learn something that we're interested in. And when we do our cultures, we don't have vascular cell, uh, we don't have vasculature, we don't have blood flow. And if we're just taking one single cell type, of course, we have all the same problems that we would have for the isolated iPSCs. So here's just some examples of data with a couple of these types of, uh, of techniques that I've told you about. This is human postmortem tissue from superior temporal gyrus. This was work that was led by Robert Kofi when, when I was still in Boston uh, about oh, eight years ago now. And what Robert and I were able to do is adapt the technique called array tomography, which is sort of a, an amalgamation of immunohistochemistry and electron microscopy to get very good resolution and look within individual synapses to see what proteins are there. And what we observed was that around amyloid plaques, which are stained here in blue, you have a loss of synapses and you have accumulation of amyloid beta within individual synapses. Here you can see a, a synaptic pair with a presynapse in uh, red and a postsynapse in green. And in this little, this little postsynapse, there is some blue A beta and you can see it here in a pre. And what we observed in the humans is that as you get closer to plaques, you lose synapses, you have more of this pathological protein accumulating in them. And this is affected by one of the risk genes, ApoE4. What we're able to do then in mice is we can confirm that that one particular phenotype of plaque associated synapse loss is very well modeled. So that was, the, that was an important step for us to be sure that we were modeling something that was relevant to the disease. And then in the mice, so we confirm that A-beta accumulates in synapses in not just one model, but in very several models of these familial Al Alzheimer's disease uh, mutations that have plaques. 
When we remove soluble oligomeric A beta while leaving the plaques, we can rescue synapses. And here's one example of that. Here's a, a dendritic spine, a, a dendrite here with spines on it that we before treatment imaged and then added an antibody from Elan, Elan Pharmaceuticals called 3D6. And an hour later is just one example of a new spine forming. So we can lead to some new synapses forming by removing A beta. Uh, we've also been able to see from mice that around plaques we have severe microgliosis and that groups like um, Soyeon Hong and Beth Stevens have shown microglia eating synapses around plaques. So we're able to see these familial AD models accurately model plaque associated synapse loss, but what they don't model is neurodegeneration. And we've also been learning that there are some other differences even in the microglia and neurons, which are similar to humans, but not identical. So one of the more recent things we've been doing in the lab is PhD student Marcus Sioras has been looking at microglial phagocytosis of synapses. So again, we're now in postmortem human brain where Marcus observes that microglial processes labeled here in magenta contain synaptic material. Here's presynapses around plaques, and this is higher in AD cases than controls. But again, that's a snapshot at the end stage of disease. So we were able to collaborate with surgical colleagues and Veronica Moran, who is an expert in isolating microglia from resected tissue, took surgical resected tissue from two patients generated microglia from these and then applied human Alzheimer's disease brain homogenate to challenge the microglia. Um, it's actually, sorry, Alzheimer's disease synaptic neurosome preparation. So these are synapses from human Alzheimer's cases postmortem. And what Marcus observes then is that these microglia in culture, which are labeled here with DAPI, actually phagocytose the human synapses, which are tagged with Frodo. So they glow red when they're phagocytose. And you can see that happens a little bit more in a, when you feed them AD synapses than when you feed them control synapses. And in collaboration with Thora Karadotir and Balash Varga, we were able to recapitulate this in iPSC-derived microglia from three different healthy donors. So we can get a little bit more numbers with the iPSCs, but again, they're very embryonic cells and they eat much faster. They eat these synapses from human brain much faster than our adult resected microglia or our primary mouse microglia, but they do eat the AD synapses a tiny bit faster than the control synapses. So that was just a few snapshots of data to, to try and make the point that I think we need multiple approaches to solve complex brain disorders. And indeed, as Sam and Peter pointed out, to understand the fundamental workings of the brain. We need model systems in our case that really accurately reflect the disease or the phenomenon of study. We need to interrogate these models. This is my most important point, I think, only for the questions that they can accurately address. And that's really hard in some cases to determine, but I think we need to be really careful about that. Otherwise, what we're learning is not going to be very relevant. So that's all I wanted to, to say, other than to thank my lab who generated the data and our collaborators, and that I very much look forward to the discussion with the group. Thank you very much, Tara. So, um, so what we're going to do now is to move to the panel discussion, and we've got um, one or two questions that we'd like to put to the panel, and uh, we're... Um, open for more questions that might come up as people are listening to the discussion. So please just post to the chat and we'll um, pick up some of those and um, put them to the panel as well. So we're going to start with one that's just come from the audience. It seems that translating between different models and humans is key. How can we improve communication between animal and clinical labs to increase translation? Who would like to take that? I could certainly start with that. I think it's it, it's a great question. Thank you. And I'm glad to see we, we had 180 attendees. We thought at the beginning we might be the only people awake. So thank you, those of you who have come <laughs> and woken up on a Sunday morning. I think it's def it's very difficult to be an expert in everything. So, you know, to be a, a clinician studying the disease and to be a real expert in transgenic mouse modeling, for example. So collaboration is key. Um, and how can we better enhance communication is a great question. I think we, we do it well in some places. We have a, a, an organization here called Edinburgh Neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh that specifically links researchers across the spectrum from fundamental to clinical and informatics and psychology. And I think those kind of networks are very, very important for that. I don't know if Peter could also speak to this because you have very good connections with your clinicians. You were mentioning proximity. Yeah, the fact that you're on one campus and you are basically the same buildings as the hospital helps a lot, of course. Um, and there are many initiatives worldwide, I think, where people see that this need is really there, that you have to bring basic scientists and clinicians together to solve these big problems. 
I think one fundamental issue for us also is that people that do animal research should never be defensive about the, their animal model because it is a model, eh? it's just a model. So, and it has weaknesses. Every animal model has weaknesses. And yes, the, the human brain is our target, but it's just really difficult to investigate all these questions in the human brain. But we have to really pay close attention to the points where these animal models do not translate to the human. I think it's this, this important to recognize it and to say, okay, then how can we go about it? Yes, sir? Sam? Sam, yeah. have you got, um, Sam, as, as a more basic scientist, have you got thoughts about how we can... Um, Engage more. I think one of the, a couple of things that both Tara and Peter touched on there. I think one issue now is just the sheer volume of information or knowledge that is required, and it's really difficult to get beyond domain-specific knowledge into into general kind of things and to understand, I suppose, what questions can be approached in X model system or in humans now. Even I, you know, I didn't even know that you could make those recordings now, Peter. So just keeping on top of uh, those kind of things is so difficult, so difficult in this kind of expanded information age, that having some kind of frameworks in which people can communicate that a bit more internationally, that, you know, these databases that become available, maybe prediction machines that can actually allow a clinician to say, well, what is known from uh, about this or for an animal, person who does animal experiments to ask that as well. I just, I, I just worry that uh, there's so much knowledge in the world now that to keep him on top of that individually, even the small groups of um, collaborators, makes it very difficult to. It's always a challenge to expand out since there's so much knowledge coming in. And that's, I think, going to be a really big challenge to overcome to be able to make sure those collaborations are tight enough to allow the translation to occur. Thank you. Okay, so I have an, another question here. So there's a um, there's always a dynamic tension between the um, trying to minimise animal use for ethical reasons, but wanting to get um, the best quality data that we can. So um, do the panel have thoughts about how um, we can find that balance? So, for example, um, there's been um, a mandate from NIH that experiments should be done on equal numbers of male and female animals, but that might mean that we have to do more animal experiments to get the, the numbers up in both groups. So how do we, how do we, um, how do we minimize animal use, but um, not, not end up with poor experiments that mean that we ultimately have to do more um, research? I think training our students and our postdocs and ourselves in rigorous experimental design is really key to that. Because as you say, if we don't do enough, then there's no point really in the experiments. So what uh, having really solid training on how you design experiments, how you do your power calculations, how you understand the effect size that you need and how many animals you'll need is, is the only way. And, and how to avoid statistical pseudo replication, which is one of my pet peeves as a reviewer, how to how to robustly analyze your data. I think that's that's something that we're working on here. And I'm sure around the world, everyone is working on your training programs to help train our students and postdocs and importantly ourselves, I've learned are this lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> so so do you think that the P is 0.05 is a sufficiently rigorous criterion? It's the one that we kind of use um, and the statisticians tear their hair out and say we should be all becoming Bayesians. Like, do we need more statistical training for animal researchers? Well, I think the statistics or the published data now, they, I mean, it's very hard to publish anything that is not statistically sound, eh? I think these days. In the past, it was different, especially in, in systems neuroscience, people are really looking, really looking into the statistics. The, the monkey world is a bit vulnerable in this respect because we don't do large numbers of animals. We try to we do statistics on an individual animal on many measurements and replic try to replicate it in a second animal or a third animal. Um, and that has the advantage that you use minimum number of animals. The problem is that you have studies that remain unpublished if the data are variable between subjects. 
And that is a real big weakness because nobody knows these things. And so there should be a journal for these kinds of observations that, okay, be careful if you do this, you might see very beautiful things in one animal and nothing or something else in another animal. And that is something that is hardly addressed in our world, that is interindividual variability. The things that are published are usually very general and you find it to some degree in every animal. That's fine. But you don't know what is not published. Huh? That's a weakness in our field, I think. We need a journal of file draw results. Yeah, that's okay. This is important to show that the results are variable with this approach or this system or whatever. Uh, be careful. <laughs> so, and we don't have that yet, I think. I think um, but getting back to Tara's point as well, I think these are, uh, there's a move towards open data access and open science. And I think th this does deal with these problems to some degree, right? So there may well be only two animals in lab X and one animal did something and the other animal did something so that data never gets published. But if three other labs in the world were doing similar experiments and it turned out that you know, there was a fairly coherent observation across those four eight animals or whatever, then this is something that is greater than the sum of the parts of the individual laboratories. And that is really only accessible if the data is open anyway. And this also could help reduce animal numbers more broadly, right? So we often do controls which are unnecessary. They've been just replicating controls and the other people have done in the same or at least very similar environments. Um, so how, how it, by opening up the data sources that we're actually creating, I think could lead to both reducing the numbers of animals that are required and also enhancing the robustness of the actual observations that we're making. I think we have a question from the audience. We're still very focused on rodents and monkeys in terms of animal models. Do you think there is a need to branch out more from this to other types of animal models? Uh, well, we are focused on this more or less by accident. I mean, there are many people, the genetics is really, the, in the Drosophila, is really a very important model for genetics. So we are, it's not considered to be an animal like uh, like vertebrate animal models, but it is a model, right? So, and a lot of these genetic insights come from Drosophila, I think. And so, there's a whole spectrum, but... Um, yes, some animal models also disappear over time. Eh? I think uh, Sam can comment about that. The cat model in, in visual neuroscience used to be very, very popular, and suddenly it disappeared. Or oh, very few people still do cat visual neuroscience eh? because the brain areas were not really could not be related to the human. Probably eh? V1 is similar, but all the rest we don't know. So there is a dynamic in, in the field, I guess, which is good. Uh, some models come and some others go. I would mention zebrafish are also oh, beautiful yeah. models for, we have people doing spinal cord regeneration like Katerina Becker and, and they, they are amazing for some things. I think somebody posted in the chat about flies for Alzheimer's and they're, I think Drosophila can be an excellent model for some aspects of cell biology that is sort of an in-between house from isolated cells in a dish to a, a brain with the normal sort of cell complement and, and vasculature that we see in humans. If you're careful, careful with the question, I think many of these model systems can be excellent for, for certain aspects of the disease modeling, absolutely. Okay, next question. Many grants and goals of research aim to, find the single, aim to find the single cause of a particular neurodegenerative disease to provo propose some sort of single point of treatment. How do you see drug-driven research playing out with multiple models, particularly when the drug models are only considered for mice, rats, and primates? So a similar question about the focus of the model. <laughs> um, so multiple models, so developing drugs with multiple animal models um, yeah. targeted I would like to draw the analogy with the field of cancer research. Cancer has no single cause, eh? but they were very successful in finding treatments to, well, to prolong the disease, to slow it down. And probably neuroscience has to follow a similar approach. We cannot assume that 
as one single cause for all neurodegenerative disease. But if we find more and more targets, we could sort of prolong life and that would solve many, many problems. Eh? We're also learning a lot about delaying the onset of these age-related diseases. And if you can put it off by five or 10 years, that's massive for quality of life. And um, and multiple models that are being used for that as well. So we're learning a lot in mice about environment, gene environment interactions, for example, that we hope then can be translated into lifestyle modifications in people. Um, they're pretty much common sense. If you exercise and eat well, you can lower your own risk and likely delay onset if you are genetically predisposed. But I think we still need the model work to try and tease that apart if we ever want to get to something that's not just eat well and hope for the best. So we're, we're, we're using multiple models to try and get at effective preventions or treatments. But it's also the point in that question seems to also be about a single point of treatment. And I think that the question that the person is right, that there's likely to be multiple interventions that would be more effective than a single intervention. And it may be even disease stage specific. So something might be great for helping prevent or slow at the beginning. But once you get to a certain stage, that's going to be absolutely useless. And you'll need to swap over to something that will then modulate the neurodegenerative phenotype and try and slow down the cell death, for example. So for those kind of questions, again, we really need to understand the fundamental biology, and it's just not all there yet. So that's why we're still in the model stages. So, so I have a question about how many models is enough. So, I mean, there are obviously big differences between rodents and humans. You know, we saw in the thalidomide disaster, for example, you know, that all this drug was tested on lots and lots of rodent models. Um, so how do, we, how do we be confident before we take something to humans in clinical trials that we've, exp that, that we fully understood the biology if we have just a small number of um, other types of animal models. For example, could computer modeling AI um, methods help? Or are we not there yet with those? Can I just um, maybe put one thing in there? I think generally a model is successful if it does well at predicting um, a, a future intervention. And I think that's something we don't do an, enough of really. So formal model testing and formal hypothesis prediction in, in terms of this like there should be possible to make a prediction about drug X in system Y. And if we can't make that prediction, we don't know enough about the underlying systems. But if, that, if we can make that prediction and it's wrong, then it tells us that there's something about that's problematic about the, the actual um, translation that we're, we're trying to do. So I, I feel like that there's, again, this is a bit of a call for open data and open research. The more that these things are accessible to people who can actually make predictions and test those predictions, different systems, then the more certain you are that you can um, predict the, the, I suppose, the work in animals and how to translate that into humans and different model species into humans. And you should be able to make a systematic set of predictions that can be tested for various things. Minimal, a systematic but minimal set of predictions and should be able to identify that for any system I would have thought. So if we can, but the kind of architectures you need for that are beyond single labs or beyond even research institutes, generally speaking, they're about large scale kind of collaborative research. And I'm not quite sure if we quite have the capacity in that domain at the moment. So I've got a question now about the future. Um, where, where should we be moving in terms of animal models? So what, what will animal research look like in let's say a hundred years from now? Um, if things went optimally, can we eradicate it, for example? Um, in my opinion, we will, it will be very different from what we do now, but there will always be things that we want to test in animal models before we got tested in humans, I think. So we cannot assume that in well, 100 years, maybe too much for us, eh? but 50 years, for example, can we have all the information we need about the visual system, for example, or any system, so that we can just know how it is working? Probably not. So, and there will be also new technologies em emerging, I think, that you really want to test first in, human, in animal models before you apply them in humans. So, I, don't, I think it will be different, but it will still be 
useful and important to do it, in my opinion, at least. Unless, as you mentioned, Sam, unless we have a really beautiful computational model of a brain that can accurately, if we, if we found out everything we needed to know in the next hundred years about individual components of the brain and how they work together and could accurately model it, that would be wonderful. And then we wouldn't need animals. But I think you're right, Peter. I think it's going to be a long time before we can go directly to a human with a treatment uh, based on something that has never seen a mammalian brain because something I don't think about very often, but stuff does exist below the neck. And so you, even if we had something brilliant that would help the brain, you really do have to make sure it's not going to kill the rest of you. So I think you're right. I think we're a long way off of, unfortunately off of, of losing animals forever out of research. So Tara, somebody has asked um, about your opinion of uh, brain organoids as a, as a possible alternative. Is that feasible? Yeah, great question. So there's there's some great work going on in organoids. I, I didn't speak about them because we don't use them because we work on neurodegeneration. And so for me, they they seem to be really super useful for, for some neurodevelopmental studies, for example, because you can see the cell types developing. Um, and I didn't talk about them just because I don't know the ins and out of them that well. But I think they do have multiple cell types. They have beautiful ability to, to show how things interact and change over time. So yeah, another excellent model. Um, for our field, I think they have a lot of the same disadvantages as IPSCs, which is they're very young, right? So for, for what we study, I haven't had a question yet that I thought, oh, I need an organoid to answer that question. Uh, but I think, again, another really nice alternative model. All right. Sam, any thoughts on the future? Um, again, I, I, I agree with what Tara and Peter said. I, I suspect that, you know, the brain is incredibly complex. <laughs> Let's just start with that. And it develops as dynamic, so, and there's billions of components. So the likelihood that we have a model of it in any reasonable sense is, is, is pretty down the road. But I think it would, I would still like to be able to say to my sister, for example, who opposes animal research, when I would draw the line on needing an animal. And and I'm not sure that we have even, I mean, I'm not sure we have any consensus at all in that respect, but there should be a formal way of defining that, that we would agree on and that someone else who may be opposed but willing to accept that it's necessary would agree on. That it may not be possible now to remove animals from research, but when we reach this kind of stage in the future, that that would be a sufficient um, knowledge base from animals to, to not require it. And, I suspect, as Peter's alluding to, that you're still going to want to do um, toxicity studies effectively in, in many cases, but there's many things that are not effectively toxicity studies to um, the form neuroscience. So I'd like to see if we could actually do that. I don't know if we can. I mean, it's a very really hard question to answer, but um, it'd be really interesting to know if we could actually come up with a set of criteria that we would be happy to say, all right, if we can do that, we wouldn't need an animal to be able to answer the experimental questions. I think so. The Most of the cases that I know, it's very obvious. Huh? Like the polio vaccine, they used to use hundreds of monkeys to make the polio vaccine, and they switched to in vitro to, to cell cultures. And that reduced the number of monkeys used in Belgium like by 95% or something, because the company, because JSK, was situated in Belgium. And of course, then it's obvious, it's safe, they tested it, it's the same effect. Of course, nobody would object to that to say, okay, we'll leave the, we just owe everything in cell cultures. So most of the times it will probably be very obvious that, oh yeah, this we can do, and we don't need an animal model for this. Right. Well, I love the so idea of the framework, Sam. I love the idea of coming up with the future framework for when we would agree that we no longer needed animals for certain questions. That sounds like a great job for fence. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so given, given that everybody agrees that for the foreseeable future, we are going to need to carry on. Um, is there anything we can do to um, improve the quality of lives of the animals that we are using at the moment that beyond what we are doing? Um, well, I think we've seen a very, very positive evolution in the last uh, 20 years, I would say. I mean, for monkey research, but also rodent research. Yeah? So the housing conditions are 
completely different now than 20 years ago. Um, we are very close to mimicking a lot of their natural behavior in a laboratory environment in many labs in Europe, not everywhere around the world, that is true, but they can be sort of expressing their natural behavior and at the same time participate in experiments for longer, for very long periods of time. And so um, we've seen a very, very positive evolution and that will continue, I think. So we get better and better in social housing and in enrichment and in uh, non-invasive or minimally invasive uh, procedures and things like that. So I think it's going the right way. Yeah, continually working with our vets and the home office to refine and, and reduce and sort of make sure the enrichment is right, make sure that we're at best practice going for the, the latest data on what they need to be happy and, and fulfilled, I think is, is I, I agree with you, Peter. I think we are going the right way over many years. Things have been improving and that the animal units have been very quick to adapt and add whatever new enrichment or whatever new protocols uh, to, to refine the treatment. And I think we have to really keep on with that though, keep, keep our eye on it. Sam, any? any uh, I suppose, I mean, I think there has been there's been a step change in 20 years since I've been doing research about how even just the focus I mean, on the actual concern and interest in looking after animals' um, well-being during their time in the lab. Uh, it, I think there's a, there's a mixture, I suppose, of both um, encouraging carrots and I suppose there's also always potentially sticks as well, with like, you know, saying that you can only publish this paper if this form of... Um, enrichment is this minimal enrichment or minimal kind of design has been employed. Um, I don't see that in operation too much. We do that in certain domains, but not really in a holistic domain for, for the animals that form part of studies. So that will be, but I think there's been a lot of progress without resorting to those sticks in the last 20 years. Now. And anyway, I'm not sure that's absolutely necessary, but that's one way that one could always try to beef it up if it's necessary. Okay, well, I think we, we do have more questions, but I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, so I'd like to thank the panel very much. It's been really interesting um, presentations and interesting discussion. And I'd like to thank the anonymous audience that we know are out there, but we, we can't see them. <laughs> um, and hope that you'll have, go and have some conversations about um, animal um, experiments and how we can refine and reduce and all the rest of it. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, thank you.